most endangered species has something unique about them that they need a very specific niche or type of habitat to meet their needs. The red cockaded woodpecker is not any different. Flying squirrels are probably one of our biggest issues. They uh, take over the cavities and trash them up to where the birds can't use them. So probably our biggest uh, issues that we have to deal with. They'll eat eggs and young as well. So um, they're kind of a, a problem all the way around. The red cockaded woodpecker is an endangered species that we have here on the wash tall. We've got a wide variety of tools that we use to manage for the species. We restrict the cavities to keep them from being enlarged. We clean the cavities out, remove the squirrels and relocate them. We monitor their nesting activity and the recruitment of the species. The management of the timber, the thinning of the timber, restoring the mid-story condition to appropriate densities and the use of fire to maintain it all. It's all intertwined together to provide habitat in this ecosystem. Most people had never even seen this species and I get to work with it daily, helping provide what it needs to survive and thrive. We know from historic accounts of travelers, a lot of the forests were comprised of old trees open stands with a lot of herbaceous vegetation and forbs in the understory. And that's what shortleaf pine blue stem really is. It's a prairie underneath the forest. The reason for these stands being open was that they burned regularly. They burned regularly on their own and they were burned regularly prior to European settlement. Native Americans were burning these woods for a long time, across the United States actually. We harvested the virgin forest from 1880 to 1920 across the south. That was followed by a period where wildfires were pretty common and had fairly devastating in those cutover stands. And so society invested an awful lot of effort in controlling wildfire. That withdrawal of fire from the landscape also had unintended side effects. And one of those side effects is that we lost flora and fauna that are adapted to a fire adapted condition. We had a lot of overstocked, dense stands with woody mid-stories because of fire suppression and fire exclusion. A lot of things had been lost. Elk were gone, bison were gone. We almost lost red cockaded woodpeckers. We got off on the right foot by having research scientists look. Here's the problem. You've got to have landscapes of open stands, herbaceous understories, and older trees. Once they gave us that answer, they gave us an objective. Okay, we had a regional variance today for humidity dropping down below 24%. Um, so, so we did get approval for that. Fire to me, as far as prescribed burning goes, is kind of fascinating in a way. You're taking an element that can run out of control and then you're trying to make it do the things that you want it to do. And so there's a lot of art to that. Implementing the control burns allows us to plan and then so fires now on our terms. We're reducing the fuels by implementing a control burn. We're setting the plan parameters, the goals and objectives for the burn. You know, these places evolved and adapted with frequent fire fire here under the right situation is something that is right as rain for these ecosystems. It's an amazing tool to clean up the landscape, to reset it. If you're successful and you're able to burn through those areas and then you come back in the spring and you see that beautiful green grass growing everywhere, there's a ton of satisfaction in that. It's a great thing to help the ecology of the area. There is a pretty simple recipe for restoring these forests. You do prescribe fire under the appropriate conditions at the right time of year, and you implement certain types of timber management activities, and you monitor that, and you see where you're going annually with those tools. Without managing timber, 
and then selling that as wood products in a sustainable long-term way, then you have no way to finance the prescribed burning or anything else you want to do out there. Done in the right way, you can fund in perpetuity restoration. It's like an autopilot. Using these tools, fire, timber, thinnings, we begin to build a pretty incredible, biodiverse, healthy, and resilient place for nature and people. This all began really with the red cockaded woodpecker. We started, we had about nine groups. And today, we've got more than 70 groups. This population fledges more than 100 young every breeding season. That's a huge success for an endangered species. That's the basic metric for is the work successful. But we've come to realize that creating this habitat to help the red cockaded woodpecker has helped dozens of other species of flora and fauna that we value as well. It is a lot of work, but it's not just managing for the red cockaded woodpecker. It's taking care of the whole ecosystem, providing habitat for all the species here. 